and welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is an online panel for the show Savages and Princesses, The Persistence of Native American Stereotypes. So everyone's familiar with Native American stereotypes. This exhibition uses art since art is a catalyst for new ways of thinking for why specifically stereotypes of Native Americans are so persistent in mainstream culture. Um, we're very happy to be um, uh, joined today by art writers and also several of the artists in the show. I am American Meredith. I'm the, um, I'm the publishing editor of First American Art Magazine and I also curated the initial iteration of the show in Tulsa, Oklahoma at 108 Contemporary. Our land acknowledgement is very easy today because the show is at the Seminole Nation Museum in Wewoka, which is the capital of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma and the capital of the Seminole Indian Reservation, whose boundaries were just upheld recently in court cases. Today, I'm very honored to be joined by Anita Fields, who is Osage and Muskogee. She's a clay sculptor and textile artist. Um, she, she sews regalia, Osage ribbon work, and also installation art. She's based in Stillwater, Oklahoma, but is currently a Tulsa Artist Fellow. She's shown throughout the United States, but also in Europe and many other places. Um, we're also joined by Stacy Pratt, who's Muskogee. She's uh, got a doctorate. She's Dr. Pratt. She's a writer, musician, independent scholar. She's a staff writer for the International Music Nonprofit and a regular contributor to First American Art Magazine. She's based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She earned her master's degree in literature from the University of Arkansas and has a doctorate in creative writing, poetry, from the University of Southern Mississippi. Karen Walking Stick, whose work is in the show, is an um, enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation. She's an award-winning ceramic artist based in Enola, Oklahoma, on the Cherokee Nation and the Cherokee Indian Reservation. She's a princess with a Cherokee National Treasure, Jane Oste, and also a Wyandotte artist, Richard Zane Smith. But she's gone on to create her new styles in clay, which she will discuss today. So my first question to the panelists is, while every group has stereotypes, why do you feel that the stereotypes about Native Americans are so much more per pervasive in the public psyche than actual facts? I can start. Uh -huh, thank you, Stacy. So one thing that I noticed, so I taught up north of Syracuse, and there are Native people up there, but not in my little area where I was teaching. And I'm from Oklahoma, so everybody here knows, in, knows Native people. But I think one of the reasons that the stereotypes persist is because there are more communities than we realize who don't see Native people in day-to-day -day life. And so for them, Native people are something from the past, you know, a legend, or they'll say, we, of course, we've heard of people that say, well, you know, my great-great-grandma was Cherokee usually. Um, but I think it's, I really think the stereotypes persist just because there isn't a lot of modern representation of Native people um, for, the, for those communities that don't have them in them, you know. But we're kind of in a different era where you think YouTube, I mean, how many powwows, 49s are on YouTube, 1491s, social media, almost every, um, almost every tribe has their own website with, um, and they all have the information about the history. So I think that's a cop out because the information <laughs> is now available to anyone who can go to the library. I don't so, think they realize that though. They honestly okay. don't. My, I know that my students didn't. Um, yeah. We, we still had nations. And I'm like, the Mohawks are right there and the Onondagas are right there. How do you not know this? So they, they know casinos, maybe. Um, yeah. I, I don't know why. I feel like sometimes they don't know how to look. And I also taught, so I taught literature and I taught research. Mm -hmm. and yeah. One thing that is a problem is when you type in Native American or Indigenous or Indian which some people still use, you have to type in all those different things. They don't mm -hmm. know type in a specific tribe. So if you type in Native American on Pinterest, never do that. You will oh, get God, no. the very things that we're talking about in Savages and Princesses is, is what tends to come up on the first Google um, searches. And I think that's still a problem, even though we've had the internet for this long at this point. And so I think that's part of the problem, even when, you know, even when you are, searching the, the, the kind of garbage stereotypes yeah. outnumber facts yeah. and yeah. actual representations to such a degree yeah i think so and and i'm just re recently learning about search engine op optimization and i think that a lot of native uh stereotypes persist because of that the words are still 
accumulating at the top of your search, um, especially if you use something that's Native American, American Indian, rather than going to say Muscogee or Cherokee or Osage. So, um, Anita, do you want to follow up with your views of why you think stereotypes of Natives have persisted? Sure. I think that um, it's, it's much easier for uh, mainstream society to see us still in a ro real romanticized version of who we are, uh, because that's what's kind of led up to uh, this point now, is still relying on those images, still relying on you know, film still relying on um, all of the things that stereotype us. It's easier not to think of you know, because those things are done in the deep, de de human, you know, de uh, humanizing us. So, with that, you know, kind of effort being forth, and that's how you know people are seeing us. Then it's easier to keep us in that role because then they don't have to look at the history of um, you know the painful history that we have here in America, that is our, our original homeland. So I think that there's a real resistance, you know, to wanting to know the truths and, uh, you know, doing the research that it takes to find that out. Because just like where you were at, Stacy, you know, I, I feel like too in Oklahoma with the 39 tribes, you know, with just a handful of tribes that this was homeland. And I know for Osages, this was uh, also, you know, this was, Oklahoma was not new to us, Indian territory. This, you know, we came this far down in, in terms of hunting, you know, and when we would make that move to hunt. So um, people don't know those stories either. You know, it's really surprising. Um, I don't know how many times I've been told, you know, somebody read, you know, just happened to read for instance, a pipe in February or, you know, something else they would say, I had no idea this happened. And this is right in their backyard, many times in their county, many times, um, you know, I mean, we can just talk about Tulsa, for instance, how many people who are from Tulsa actually know the history of Tulsa? Or even the Tulsa is a Muscogee Creek word. R right, exactly. And that it is the Osage and Creek um, reservation. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's all Indian land. Exactly. I mean, that's, uh, to me, that's very surprising. I find that really hard to believe when people tell me this. So, you know, again, kind of pointing this back to art and, you know, making things and creating. And uh, that's why it's so very important in my mind that we continue to move forward, you know, telling our stories. And I feel like, you know, right now that there's just a renaissance of that kind of thing happening, which is wonderful. You mean information getting out? Yeah, and creating art, you know, telling our stories. Um, it does nothing but um, counteract, you know, the kinds of things we're talking about. And then Karen, Walking Stick, would you be willing to discuss some of your perspectives of why you think stereotypes against Natives are so much more persistent than perhaps with other groups around the United States? Yes, so um, the piece I did in the show is a gang word, and I took the approach to it as a, something to spark a conversation. Just to, um, if, if you're trying to tell someone your viewpoint and you know they're, they're not familiar with it, it's real easy to slam your ears shut and just not hear it because you feel very, um, somebody's at fault, you know, I think that's why a lot of times we can't have the conversation because, well, it, it points to somebody being at fault somewhere. So the right. approach that I took was through cartoons, because if you and I are having a conversation about cartoons, neither one of us are at fault. We can blame it on the other guy, right? So the, right. whoever made the movie. But we can talk about it freely. So that's why I took the approach that I did um, with the cartoons, because it, it it's, it comes at it a little bit softer. It's not a in your face thing. So um, coming at it from that viewpoint, I've been looking uh, over all these cartoons from the past and these kids see this, these movies at a very young age. It's ingrained in them from very little. And Disney now has a disclaimer on the front of their movies that, you know, talks about that they're going to leave the movie the same, but they're going to add a disclaimer. First of all, the child cannot read. You know, if it's a little kid, they're not reading that. I, I don't know how many parents prop their kids in front of movies and, and don't read it themselves, you know, while they're off doing something else. Or, uh, but these kids, 
watch this from a very young age and it, it starts there and it just keeps going. I did run across this um, video uh, from Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids from 1973. And that is the best cartoon I've come across where it talks about real life things. There was a little Hopi boy in this and then and all the little, all the Albert kids running around there uh, talking about this kid and all the stereotypes that he brings and and they were saying, well, you're not Hopi, you're not a real Indian because you don't fit the stereotype. Little boy kept, you know, it goes on and on and finally they come across an adult and the adult tells them to go to the library. Go to the library, go to the library and check it out. So um, that was from 1973. So all of these other movies that have came behind that, I think they could learn a little something from that show. Um, that's the best one I've come across. But as far as it, it, persistence, it, it starts young and they go to school. They're getting this much of a paragraph in in the in their books, you know, in their um, school books, and they're not learning very much about it. They're learning the generic Indian. They're not learning about all the tribes and how different they are, and, and uh, it's a lot of effort for them to go on their own to go look up all these individual things. It's a time consuming and and they'd rather be kind of spoon fed. So if we could shorten something down and give it to them in a better way, I think it would help. Right. So you're really talking about mass media and um, would you all care to discuss kind of um, your understanding of mass media, um, how this mass media has uh, allow these stereotypes to persist, and then how mass media has changed recently in their representation of Native Americans? So that's open to any panelist that wants to jump in. I remember how to unmute myself. I'll start again. Um, so mass media, uh, we're, we're the 1%, you know, we're always on every graph. There are a tiny amount of Indian people or will be other, you know, everything's there. So population wise, I think it's, been easy to ignore us or to just we're, we're spoken about much more often than we're allowed to speak for ourselves and that has been true for a long time um, and I think it's changing but but it's ingrained that we're a subject as opposed to a speaker and uh, I think a show like Savages and Princess is so important because it's like we can say we do see what you're doing we also are your readers and we're also your consumers and we're also your audience. We're not just your subject. And, and I think that's important for the mass media. And the more of us become writers and artists and filmmakers, you know, we see two shows getting ready to come out, Sterling's and Anna DuVernay's that are going to be on television. And like Karen was saying, we didn't, didn't see ourselves a lot. You know, we had Buffy St. Marie on Sesame Street. Yes. <laughs> that is, it. you know, as far as real people. Um, so I think that we were talking about social media or uh, I guess the internet and things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I think that's really helping the mass media because there is no gatekeeper. You know, you can make your TikTok or your YouTube channel and there that's leading to, I think more um, publishers saying, Hey, people are actually interested in this. And so we'll put our money behind it. And I think that's true in all the, all of the media. So that's, I'm talking about mass media as far as popular. I'm not going to get into the news and things like that, but that's my. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Anita, what do you, what's your take on um, kind of the of evolution of uh, Native portrayals in mass media and kind of how that's changing now? Okay. So, you know, I, I can go way back, you know, in terms of, of what we were used to seeing when um, I was a young person or in terms of film or movie. And I was having this conversation not too long ago, actually, with somebody. And I said, we were so underrepresented, you know, in terms of film or uh, story. And so when you did see something, you know, albeit it was kind of strange movie or something, mm -hmm. or, you know, very tragic, and maybe the actors were not even Native American, it was the only representation we had. You know, it was the only representation that was out there. And so there was a sense of, oh, that's representing us. You know, we're on the, we're on the screen. And so it was, it's, today, that's very strange to think about, you know, in terms like that. Because like Stacy said, we have these you know, great uh, filmmakers and we have, um, you know, great storytellers. We have wonderful writers. We have good artists, you know, who are putting messages out there, you know. 
and mass media is, you know, really uh, mind changing. I mean, I can just think of the, the guy with the cranberry juice just, you know, very recently, you know, I mean, look how many people saw that. And, and you know, he's native too. So they were telling oh, me that, the Arapahoski border. Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's yeah. Not, very, you know, not the last two weeks, you know, actually. So, um, but for us, you know, individually and as people, you know, what we see coming from our own in, uh, I love it, you know, to be able to get on Instagram or Facebook and see all of these exciting, um, you know, young people making contributions in terms of uh, making expressions about who we are. So mass media has a huge impact, you know, not only on our communities, but on the communities outside of, of where we live, you know, to, to um, understand who we are. That's why it's so important, <laughs> you know, because that just still exists, you know, that idea of, um, and I know these ladies have heard this too, crazy, crazy questions that just are, you know, not true. They have no truth to them and really, really placing us so far back in history, you know, in terms of crazy questions, you know. <laughs> I mean, we could just go on and on and on and on. Right. You know, so. And then if you don't live in a teepee, then obviously you're not a Native American. Right. It's well, so it's crazy. interesting. I mean, Karen kind of brought this up, but it's like um, there's not a linear progression. You know, kind of public, public uh, media wants us to think everything's getting better. But um, yeah, the 70s were kind of a golden era for representation because of all the Native activism that was happening in the 70s, you know, and that we had Native people on TV. And then you think back to the 1930s, Will Rogers from Claremore, Oklahoma, so your neighbor, Karen, you know, he was Cherokee, he was, um, and he was the most popular, um, he was the most popular public figure in the press and he had his own movie production studio. Native Americans have been making their own movies since 1909, 1914. And then we had a, we had a Native American vice president in the 1930s. So, and then the silent film era, that would be tons of Native people acting. And many of the movies, which are now lost to history, were uh, about Geronimo and Apaches. So a uh, real Indian that kind of discusses this, um, they kind of leave out that really important beginning where Native people were so, um, you know, centered. So we've kind of, it's not that we're gaining, that we've lost quite a bit throughout the course of the 20th century, at least, and now we're regaining our foothold. But Karen, would you care to the, begin a discussion about what kind of the stereotypes tend to be these days and how they've changed? And I know this is a very unpleasant topic. These days, they're the same as they have always have been. But there's, the casino Indian's a new stereotype. Do what? Oh, the casino Indian's kind of a relatively oh, new stereotype. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, again, I'm coming at this watching a bunch of cartoons. Um, um, there's adult cartoons like the, like King of the Hill and, and those types. They're, there's an episode that they had with um, their mascot. Peter was Drunky the Clown, or Drunky the, the mascot. He was a, a football mascot, I think it was, and his name was Drunky. And he has his little fire water in his hand with this oh war paint on, and his shirt is cut where it's kind of uh, jagged, like it would be fringe. Right. Or, yeah. it, it's, it's kind of the same thing, really. I mean, it's 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 still this it's the persistence <laughs> oh i know that's that's, that's what i'm uh, um are you is that what you're talking about oh yeah no whatever you wanted to say oh yeah 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 it's whichever direction you want to go they just keep going over the same sort of thing with the um you know the over sexualized um Indian woman, you know, it just, it just, it's the same thing that I'm seeing. And then, um, Stacy, would you care to discuss some of the stereotypes, and I know, again, this is very unpleasant, but what are the stereotypes that you've seen of Native people in, also, we're talking mass media, but also um, advertising is a big one, too. Well, when we're in advertising, yeah, 
um, of course, our Land O'Lakes lady just disappeared. And I've been yeah, that's wild. I know. And that, and especially when it started to go back into the thing and say, well, this was done by a native artist. And, you know, that's, that's, you talked um, when we were discussing these questions earlier about the difference between bad stereotype representation or erasure and silence and which one is worse. Um, and I, I don't know which one is worse, honestly. But in advertising, there's, I, I don't see as much native people, but I actually don't see as much advertising anymore because I watch streaming and I think a lot of people do. <laughs> um, I will say that within the, I, I, I come from a literature background, of course. And so I know that what, what we're having to fight against is native people always being seen as very tragic. And that's the only yeah. story we get to have. And like, I, I, now I can't remember which one of you said this about if you're, oh, it was Anita. If you don't live in a teepee, you're not a real Indian. Now it's like, if you don't have a tragic, tragic story, you're not a real Indian, you know? And yeah, I mean, victimization. Like, that we oh, have to be banishing and we have to be victims. Yeah, because they, and those two things go together, you know? And I think that right now, that's the one that I see most in my life is, uh, is a victimization or making, making people assume to be tragic. Within my life, I've had the really annoying, oh, well, you're so lucky you're going to college for free. And, you know. God, yeah, that's, that's a big yeah, thing. That we have all this money that I don't, I don't that know. That we get free checks. We get I'm free still checks. still waiting for mine. <laughs> and, yeah, no, and yet we're always poor. Like, you're no, I, I wrote an essay about Crazy Rich Asians, which is a book I, series I love. And I like the movie, too, a lot. But how that's never going to be a native story because none of us are rich. And we get, there's a stereotype of this free money, but none of us are billionaires. So um, I think that that, I think that tragedy is one that really needs to be fought against right now because it, it isn't true. And it may, it, it messes with somebody like me who has had a very nice upbringing. And when you're younger and everything you read about native people is this tragic, 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 and you see it, it's not mm -hmm. untrue, you know? Right. It's but not that's untrue. not all that, to but that it's person. Not it there's horrible things happening, yeah. but the person also lives this other life and has family and people they love and care about and joys to celebrate. Interact with popular culture and interact with the world and has a job, you know, and I, we're not one dimensional objects. And I think that right. the organization theory, um, creates that stereotype. And I'll let him then, go. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, Anita, do you have any thoughts to add about what stereotypes you've seen throughout your life and then how they have changed? And um, you're unique because um, Osage definitely in the early 20th century, there's the rich, uh, the rich Indian stereotype, which people, yeah. you know, the public has forgotten about. And with that, there's also an extreme to that, you know, <laughs> we just kind of, so, it, you know, again, kind of going back to, um, what is honest and what is true. So, you know, so most people think of Osages as extremely wealthy, you know, and, and in that time period, yes, in the 20s, 30s, per person per capita, yes, the, the, oh, it, was, it was extreme wealth for that time period. That is not like that today, you know, but everybody wants to kind of see, perceive Osage people as that. So, um, you know, when you kind of grow up, uh, with people looking at you and your families like that, that can be very strange too, because that, and, and certainly that was not true for every single person. And there's a whole story, you know, behind that of uh, federal policy and, you know, how a person inherited, you know, a head right. So every single person, you know, didn't have a head right. Um, but kind of going back to what we were talking about in terms of stereotype. You know, I know when my kids were young, you know, that it was really disturbing to them to see somebody dressed up like uh, um, supposed to be an Indian, I guess, for Halloween or something. And, you know, which is coming up. Yeah, very topical. And we're going to go through it again, you know, like somebody was mentioning before, you know, the, the hyper, you know, sexualized Native woman and down to the crazy, you know, Native with marks on their face. And, you know, right. and we're going to do it all, you know, just like we do all the time. But yeah. You know, when your kids grow up seeing that, I know one of my, one of my children, you know, this child was dressed like that and said, that's not how we, and, and actually, you know, my son had just been initiated into our ceremonial dance and, you know, the whole year of preparing beautiful clothing, you know, for him to, to take part in this. 
that had happened. And then he sees this and he said to this kid, he goes, the Indians don't dress like that. And the kid goes, well, my mother made this for me. He said, I don't care who made it for you. He said, Indian people don't dress like that. So, you know, you're getting this real, um, you know, real uh, contradictory as a child, you know, somebody trying to pretend to be who you are. It's, it's, it's very crazy. And that kind of takes us to the idea of the studies that have been made and the danger, you know, in those stereotypes. I know Illuminative, you know, last year did a, a, a huge study about perceptions of Native people. And that's really kind of what we're talking about here, you know, in terms of stereotype is how we are perceived. And I think there was some really amazing uh, findings in that study, you know, about it's just exactly the same thing we're talking about. People, people just don't know, you know, they don't know our truths, they don't know our history. So, um, yeah, the thing about free money, <laughs> I always keep saying, I've been looking for that free money, you know, and I still haven't found it. So, um, do you pay taxes? Yeah, there's these right. exceptions, you know, and any benefit that we have is, is a direct result, you know, of a treaty. So, right. There's you know, land cessation. The yeah. tribes can leave land. So, if people don't want to honor the treaties, give us back our land. That's fine. Exactly. And there's no knowledge about that, you know, about the treaties right. that, and what and what we gave up. Yeah, these are not gifts at all. Absolutely not. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that's important to discuss, uh, you know, especially for young Native people, that these stereotypes cause very real documented psychological damage. And it's very hard for parents to discuss that with their children and kind of fight these... Um, these overwhelming messages, messaging that comes in from mass media and advertising. But that brings us to another conversation, which is a uh, sports mascot. So um, which of you would like to discuss, um, introduce that conversation? No like, one. <laughs> it's always yeah. a danger. So I, I, I want to talk a little bit about something else real quick about Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Made me think of it. So right behind me here are some 3D uh, canvases that were my mother's and she made them in 1981. So this is the kind of artwork that I was, we were growing up around in 1981. Well, my little sister was very small in the 80s and probably five. We were at the carnival and getting ready to go on a carousel and around the edge of the carousel were representations of different types of people. And around came this very scary war bonneted scary chief with a big scary, you know, you know the image. Mm -hmm. Came around and yeah. she just started crying. She said, I don't want to get on here. I don't want to get on here. I said, Well, what's wrong? And she said, Well, there's an Indian on there. So we're in Stillwell, Oklahoma. Every oh child God. on this carousel is an equally right, child. Right. So um, but she she was pointing at this scary thing and I said, That's that's not that's not an that's not scary. I was trying to explain to you here I am on ten or something. And I said, <laughs> We're, I said, the Indians aren't scary, we're Indian. She said, oh, I'm not Indian, we're not Indian, Indians are scary. And that's why exactly Anita was talking about that that goes in. And, but for us, we were saying, she said, I'm not Indian, I'm Creek. And yeah. I think that's really important with the mass uh, media and the pr representation of native people as this thing, because you're your tribe, like Anita said, you're your tribe, you're not Indian. Right. So, that's important. But back to the mascots. I talk so much. I'm sorry. I, so no, you're perfect. I'm not a quiet, not as Indian native, unfortunately. That's why you were invited. So, but the mascots. I always have a story. So when I was going, so fast forward ten years. I'm now I'm in college. It's the mid '90s, and I go to Northeastern State University in the '90s. That's where I got my degree. A Cherokee, historically a Cherokee um, seminary, and then became Northeastern State University. Well, at the time we were the Redmen. And our homecoming, yeah. So we were playing the Southwestern Savages. So it's the Redmen versus the Savages. Oh, and of course, down the street. Of course, I wrote so many letters to the editor. Nobody cared. It's the 90s. Um, mm -hmm. Several of us were upset. But it was, you know, now that would never have made it. That The float that said, scalp, go Redmen, scalp the Savages or whatever. Social media would have, that would have been all over the place. And it would never have flown. But at the time, it was just... You know, nobody cared about our arguments and there weren't very many of us arguing. And so but, that... But that's a thing, um, that there always has been Native resistance and yeah. only occasionally will the mainstream media pay any attention. Yeah. Like, no dapple, the Standing Rock, um, you know, protest, 
the mm -hmm. public finally got that after how many, yeah. um, you know, eight months of it happening, the yeah. public finally got that. But resistance has been always consistent. There's always been activism. Yeah. And, and eventually, in 2006 and seven, our mascots did change. So the Redmond yeah. and the Hawks and the South, excuse me, Southwestern, the Savage Storm, which, I mean, they get savage in there, but, you know, they, at least it's a storm now, and that's lonely. No, it's meteorological. It's the weather. <laughs> yeah, so, and River Hawks is a pretty cool mascot, so I'm okay with that. But, you know, I, ref I refuse to wear Redmond stuff or own Redmond stuff, and, you know. Oh, God. Weird, but it was, it's... I just think now some of the things that we witnessed and some of the things we argued against that today people would not even believe were happening that late in time. But yeah, there have always been resistors, even when it was quiet, you know. Yeah. yeah. And um, Anita, would you care to add anything on the subject of mascots, sports mascots? Sure. They're annoying. They're extremely yeah. annoying. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, you know, what happened recently, you know, with the, the change of the name, you know, with the, the Redskins was a direct result of the climate that, you know, the political climate that's happening right now. I, right. I because look how long, you know, that, that persistent fight has been going on, you know, to and, you know, uh, I applaud everyone, you know, who had a hand in that, you know, starting with Suzanne Shon Harjo, yes. uh, you know, the team of people um because it's that important you know and every you know the the uh narrative that goes along with that you know was right on all the time you know and i think that those kind of uh fights those kind of struggles is something that also you know is an inspiration to our young people in terms of like what you were saying stacy you know at your school and i know my you know my children in high school you know fought for the very same things with with just no no one listening you know would go mm -hmm. to the administration and what could be an important teaching moment just turned to a deaf ear you know very very sad you know but when so when, when you know you have to tell your children inside your own home you know that was worth that you know mentioning that that was worth saying that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's real disheartening again we're going back to you know what this does to young people you know when they hear these uh, um, I, you know, I just don't want to call them attacks, you know, constantly, you know, that you're this, you're this, you're not, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're, I mean, I know the fight that my daughter had, it was like they were burning an uh, Indian in effigy. Oh you God. Know, that's not acceptable, you know, to the native students here, the native club, you know, that's, but it was a deaf ear. So what does that say to young people, you know, in your community, when these kind of things are, you know, are able to continue on. So, um, yeah. Mascots are very annoying. <laughs> Toxic. Yeah. yeah. And but Karen, oh, I'm getting, so sorry. I, you know, I believe with all these efforts, you know, we're making that, that, that push forward always. And, and that, that's very hopeful. Yeah. So Karen and I were discussing this before, and Karen, you brought up a really good point about um, why things are changing now, and it's not due to Native activism, although that contributes. Um, you brought up the point that it's really Black Lives Matter is what um, changed the conversation. So would you care to discuss that at all? Yeah, you know, with this coronavirus going around, we've got all the time in the world to go out and protest. <laughs> so <laughs> nothing else to do, right? Um, Think how far this has changed, how, how, how much has changed in four years. The mm -hmm. uh, Savages and Princesses, Persistence of Native American Stereotype Show started in 2016, I believe it was August. Wow. Look how far, we, I don't know that we could have got that far without all, everything that's happened right now. Um, right, the allies are important. Protesting and, and making people listen and all that was you know started with to me it was george floyd um mm -hmm. and then it got everybody's attention and and they just didn't quit they kept protesting and, and you know hundreds of days of protesting and and uh made people stop and and pay attention and i think that helped a lot just across the board with um with the name change for the team the teams that are, there's what, 44 
uh, schools in San Francisco right now that are thinking of changing their names of their schools, not just, just the mascots, but the names of the schools. And oh, so it's hit on all kinds of things that it's not just one thing. It, it's kind of sparked a um, conversation all over the place with, you know, awareness, I think. It's causing people to listen a little bit more and say, am I the one being offensive? Maybe I should examine myself a little bit more, you know, and I think we could all use a little bit of it. Yeah, that we're in a time of very hard conversations and I'm really grateful to the African American community for driving that conversation. And I'm really proud of Oklahoma's native community for making space for solidarity with the African American community. And of course, there's many black native people in Oklahoma too. So I'm so proud of Oklahoma City for having a, a, a powwow in support of Black Lives Matter. I mean, that's just really extraordinary. But, um, and one thing is we've discussed how information's available, but people don't seek it out. So that's why art is a unique tool um, because there's such an emotional and aesthetic impact and art can surprise people and kind of knock them out of their, um, you know, their um, comfort zone. So yeah. since, um, Karen, since you're up, would you care to discuss your art piece in the show and how you've used art to kind of convey um, new ideas to audiences? Yeah, so um, I did this game board and it, it, it has, uh, it's a, a circular game board. It's kind of like Monopoly, but it has, I just put cartoons on it. Uh, just like I said earlier, just to spark a little conversation or, or have you question, well, why are there cartoons on here? Maybe you'll look into it a little bit more. <laughs> when we were in uh, Kansas City, when the show was in Kansas City, um, so a group of school kids who came through and saw the show, and they had these little cards on the wall, and the, the it represented all of the pieces in the show and the kids could go by and write on a piece of paper and hang it on that peg that had to do with that piece, what they wanted to say about it. And a little, couple little kids online put that they were confused and I thought, okay, they're cartoons, you know, that this will appeal to the little kids, but it confused them. Good. <laughs> Find out why it confused you. Look it up, you know, or, or look into it a little bit more. It, it's just it's just enough to just spark a conversation and and that's all that's all anybody was asking is just let's bring it up let's let's pull it out of the closet and look at it a little bit it's 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 something that deserves attention and it's getting some attention now and and i'm i'm really happy with where this show is going with what's with the climate now did i explain anything <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's fantastic. Um, and Anita, you have work in the show as well. Would you care to discuss your piece in the show? Sure. So uh, my response for the uh, exhibit was um, a small articulated um, little figure meant to be a young person, a young girl. And um, she is made out of terracotta clay and her arms and her legs move. And she's based on these little plastic articulated dolls that were from the dime store that we used to play with when I was a kid. And so I uh, made a little dress for her and then embroidered on it. Um, I can think of everything, kind of everything that we've talked about. Uh, do you live in a teepee? Um, are you a squaw? Do you get free money? And there was something else, I can't remember what it was. But at the end of the embroidery of the words that um, I left the, the um, thread loose so that she can be holding all of these loose threads in her hand. And then she has um, um, a red mark in her hair, you know, which uh, a, tra a traditional Osage woman uh, that would be appropriate for a woman to wear. That means that uh, you acknowledge your culture and so again you know kind of what we're talking just all the all the threads that we've been talking about you know here in this conversation um you have a person who's trying to understand who they are but then these microaggressions you know are, are thrown at them uh, on a regular basis and so it's very you know confusing and very kind of hard to um to separate those things you know from from um how you feel about yourself so, you know, my point in, in doing that was to say that um, 
when people hear these kinds of things, you carry them, you know, in your psyche for a very, very long time. They stay with you. You know, you wear them. Um, and again, like you use the word, they're toxic. And then you also mentioned that you might want to discuss uh, the work of Heidi Big Knife, who's a Shawnee jeweler, but she also does um, collage art. Yeah, she had an interesting piece. Uh, she has an interesting piece in there. It's called Bloodlines uh, Beliefs. And I feel like this really ties into this conversation because, uh, again, what we were talking about earlier in terms of federal policy, you know, Native people are uh, defined a lot by, uh, like no one else, you know, here on this land uh, defined by, by these federal policies. Uh, you know, carrying a car, telling you, you know, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, you know, which just began with, you know, came right out of the Department of the Interior because of war, warfare. And so you have this history, you know, this really unique history following us and still defining us who we are as, as Native people. And then, you know, what I thought was interesting about Heidi's beautiful piece is that, you know, talking about, um, because again, because of these federal policies or sometimes even the tribes, you know, uh, deciding because of their sovereignty, who will be defined as a native person. Uh, you have a lot of times, you know, when this blood quantum uh, keeps getting diluted, uh, people just kind of for the first time finding out that they're native. And so then, you know, it sets up a whole, um, uh, sets up an area where, people, you know, are kind of signing up because they want to get, uh, they want to get something that's beneficial to them in, in terms of like a scholarship or, or again, right. I think there's free money, you know? Right. And now this is not always the case. I'm just saying, you know, that I know. Yeah. This. So, you know, and then that when, you know, when she's talking about beliefs is well, as a native person, you know, how do you identify yourself? How do, you know, what, what is, what is, uh, what is true knowledge, you know, for you? Um, it, you know, again, because our histories are so unique, this just sets up so many areas that are, um, and as we keep moving forward, you know, in time, you know, these get more complicated and more complex. There's like many, many, many complex issues surrounding uh, your identification as a Native person. Absolutely. And that it follows so many facets. And I think it's always important for outsiders to understand that it's also a political identity. It's not like any other group in the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Stacy, would you care to take a moment and discuss Michael Wesley's installation? Yeah. So Michael Wesley's a Muskogee and Kiowa artist um, who recently got his MFA from the University of Oklahoma and he's based in Norman. Okay, so Micah's piece, I was surprised. So I saw this exhibit back at the beginning, you know, and mm -hmm. when it first came through in 2016. And also I'm friends, I, so Micah is one of the first artists whose pieces I bought when I grew up and had my own money. So I bought, mm -hmm. and, and I bought a, a drawing of a beautiful modern native woman with her cool long earrings. And in the, behind her was the skyline of Oklahoma City. And I love it so much. And I've since bought a couple from that series, but, and then, so I kind of knew Micah as that kind of art. And then he did a lot of art that is based on kind of the tattoo style. You know, Micah has gone through a lot of different types of drawings and I have <laughs> all of them. He you know, has a lot of allusion to native art history and things like this. So I kind of knew him as that artist. So when he was putting together this installation and we're Facebook friends, so I watched the process of it. I thought, well, this is a, not what I expected Micah to, give to savages and princesses. I was expecting a tattoo looking thing, you know, or one of the things he normally does. So this was an unusual piece for him, for me as a person who's followed his art. But yeah. I thought it was important because the, he said when he was making their fabricated um, scalps and of course with the hair hanging down. And yeah, they're scalp hanging, yeah. And they're hanging on a, um, a weathered, wooden wall, which every time I look at it makes me think of camp houses at our Creek churches, which I'm, is not the intent, but is where my yeah. personal viewership goes. And everybody's going to have something different when they see that. Yeah. And of course, scalping as a practice has various um, histories that are disputed, actually. But one thing we know for sure is that there was a time in American history when Native scalps were taken um, as bounty and collected, yeah. something that... Yeah non-native people collected as an artifact and so i think that's a really important 
piece of popular culture that is because it's not a mass media thing but it's still happening is that native bodies physically the bodies of native people have become artifacts or considered artifacts considered curiosities um, mm -hmm. to have a piece of a native literally a piece of a native body turns it turns us into something to collect as opposed to a body that's embodying our rights our personality and our humanity and so i think that's really an important thing about this piece and why i wanted to talk about it um, in Black Panther, you know, there's that famous scene in the museum where they have all the stuff and he says, well, I, oh, this is mine, you, know, I, you took it from us, you know. And that's something that happened to native bodies and that, that was a really powerful scene because of the literal bones, hair, and, you know, sometimes actual skin of native people that has been displayed for so long. Um, right, so, yes. Yeah, and that's only now beginning to change. Yeah. And That's terrifying. I have another story, <laughs> always. So when I lived in New York, um, the zoo wanted to do, it was Native American Heritage Month, and they wanted to do something for that. Uh -oh. and so that was a cool idea. And they called me because I taught Native American literature at the community college there. And I said, yeah, I'll come and talk to you about what to do, because, oh my gosh, save you from yourselves. <laughs> and, you know, what we ended up doing, my students did some research. So all the, all the animals in this particular zoo were native to New York, and we worked with some tribal um, people there to get stories about the different animals and did some displays about how they worked in their um, legends. So it turned out cool. But what they were talking about doing was putting, like, building the traditional housing of native people from around there, but at the zoo. And I was like, don't do that. Oh my native God. people, you, and this was not that long ago okay I'm talking like this was right. 2010 so um I, and they they had all the kindness in the world it completely felt that they were doing something respectful and I said you know native people used to be put on display right yes that used to be a thing in popular culture and we don't want anything to touch that memory no and, and that was that was only 100 120 years ago yeah. in the world fairs that's yeah. not that long ago no, not that long ago. And so Micah's piece just made me really think about that physicality of what um, our bodies have been to popular culture in so many ways. And then are there any final thoughts that you all have that you want to share or any loose threads that you'd like to pick up? I just want to thank you for the conversation. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, many conversations need to be happening um, around these issues. And um, this time period, again, you know, the pandemic has, uh, I find it really interesting to be able to go on Zoom and, and listen to so many interesting conversations. I think um, it, was, it was interesting, it sparked a little something when uh, Stacy said, um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank, I just said that. Um, it, we were talking about honoring your, your something um yeah we're honoring you ask yeah, 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 we're honoring you yeah. we're honored you know yeah. i'll just say we're honoring you and that we're doing this for you and this is completely the opposite yeah, yeah but now moving forward if you want the honor what they're doing at the games or with the tomahawk chop and all that stuff oh we're doing this to honor you yeah at least they came to a native person. Yes. I'm, creaking, I'm like, I'm creaking. We're in New York. Didn't you? Shouldn't you talk to an Onondaga person or something? But, um, but I was close. I was in their town. So they did the right thing. And um, I'm glad. But yeah, that, I guess my final thoughts would too. Just thank you for having me on this conversation because I'm here with three artists and I'm a writer. So I very much appreciate being here and, and speaking about this really important um, exhibition. And I'm so glad it's traveling around because I think that's important too, is that it can make it to a lot of people that need to see it. And, and you know, I think it's an inviting exhibition. Um, it asks you to laugh with it and it asks you to reflect, but it, it's, it's so um, generous in its view. So I appreciate being part of this talk and appreciate the artists for being willing to um, respond in, to respond out in public instead of just in private because that's how conversations start well thank you so much um to all of you today for sharing your time thank you to everyone who's taken the time to listen to this conversation and thank you so much to the Seminole nation museum for hosting this discussion